Hi, I'm Larry Einstein, uh, born 1226, 1949, which makes me a little over 65. I was born actually in Los Angeles, although my roots carry me back to uh, Russia as well as uh, Hungary, Romania, in that area. I was born at Queen of Angels Hospital here in LA and I lived our first year actually in the city in an apartment, but moved into Van Nuys when I was one years old and actually near currently Kester and uh, Oxnard, which was the end of the valley. Our house after that was all farmland. There were probably about 100,000 people at that time in the San Fernando Valley, very different than the 1.5 million now. It was a much different time. Um, there were four of us in our family. My brother was uh, six and a half years older. Uh, there was a long period between us because my father actually was kind of sick his whole life from complication of stroke. He had kidney disease and a large heart. But uh, we were a happy family, small house like everybody else that was in that area, very friendly. It was a very vastly different time. We burned our garbage in the incinerators back then. And actually in L.A. at that time, when you took a deep breath, if you were playing Little League, your lungs burnt. And we've come quite a long way from, from that. In my childhood, I went uh, to Kester and then Chandler Elementary Schools. Uh, I was a very good student, a high reader. Uh, they tended to put me in the, they had special at that time, gifted classes that they separated out. Uh, I was in those and really enjoyed them, and, and, and that, that was really a good, a good time. Uh, I think we were not exactly Leave it to Beaver, but we were uh, a close family. Um, my father was a CPA, and uh, he tended to do small accounts, and he, he used one of the bedrooms in the house uh, as his office. Uh, my mother at that time was a stay-home mom taking care of us uh, and uh, was very good at that and did the Boy Scout things and Cub Scout things. Uh, we were very involved in Jewish life. My parents were uh, charter members of, at that time, Valley Jewish Community Center, which became uh, a daughter of Yale. Uh, I became very active there and did, uh, because I guess I had sort of the academic side but I was blessed with a really good voice. And so the cantor there took me on, and I became a junior cantor, and uh, that's another part of the story, but I eventually cantored for many years as a sideline to my uh, medical side. We moved in 1957 to Sherman Oaks, and in fact, that house, my daughter moved in with her husband, and they live there now, and my granddaughter is growing up in my old bedroom, which is kind of an unusual Los Angeles story. So in that house, it was a very fun neighborhood, but even there, at that time in 1957, on the corner of Woodman and uh, uh, Riverside, uh, it was uh, a horse farm. So right out around the corner from us, two, two doors down, was uh, where they grew alfalfa for the horses, and they had horses. And behind us was just uh, dirt until they started to build apartments. And uh, in those years, because it was pretty soon after World War II, kind of pretending you were playing war was quite popular. So we would certainly have neighborhood games in cars with not what we like to do today, which is war toys, but was quite common in the 50s. Uh, the other thing that was common in the 50s that we were quite, my parents seemed to be interested in, was it was the Cold War. So everybody was totally panicked about the atomic bomb. And so we often went under our desks in school, shut the shades, and then we would go to Sears to go down into the bomb shelters that were for sale. Our parents wanted to take a look. I don't think we knew anybody that actually bought a bomb shelter, but they were certainly selling it. So quite, quite uh, a different time. Uh, at that time, I was uh, very active in um, school. I, I was a good student. I was active in 
singing both on um, in school at, at, in public school, but I also went to Hebrew school, so I was very active in junior congregation and doing kind of cantorial type things. So it was busy, and I loved sports, and I was in Little League, was a pitcher. Um, I had one pitch, which was a slow fastball. Uh, <laughs> couldn't make a curve, couldn't make a dive, uh, didn't have much speed, but I was accurate. So that was important in Little League, and that's what they wanted. Uh, so that was helpful. So it, it, it was juggling. I was busy between the music and, and uh, school and, uh, and, and sports as much as I, I could because I was kind of going to two schools at the same time and also running off to uh, Little League. In junior high, I went to uh, Milliken Junior High, which was about a block from our house in, in Sherman Oaks. And I was a good student there. I actually got all A's except for one B because we had a teacher that on the day that Kennedy died, she, I guess she must have been a stout Republican, but she was, didn't allow any of us to cry, didn't allow any of us to take any time off. Uh, she was really a witch, uh, Mrs. Jewell. And uh, one, in one of our final tests, uh, I, I kind of finished early, and I was talking to the girl next to me, Belinda Black, and uh, uh, she got angry. She thought I was cheating, and so she screamed at me, ripped up my paper, and said I failed the class. So uh, we went to the counselor who was actually uh, liked me a lot and somehow she convinced her to not give me an F but give me a B. So that was my B at Milliken. I, you know, it was a fun time. I had, I think, good friends there and I think it was an excellent school. Uh, it changed obviously over the years. I went off to high school in Grant High School. It was a new high school at that time. The Valley at that time, particularly schools like Grant, were not integrated. Uh, I think we had two African Americans in all of Grant High School. It was a very white school, uh, heavily Jewish, and was superb academically. I enjoyed being there. I, I did well in uh, on the academic side and was very involved in both the choir and the magical group. And uh, at some point then, because I was still going to Hebrew school, I had to kind of quit Little League. So not that I ever would have made varsity. I didn't have much, any speed or curves for that. But I probably could have done a C or B level or whatever they had at that time. But that wasn't in the cards. It just didn't have enough time. I was, I don't know, I guess in some things I might have been a leader at that time, but I was a shy adolescent. But probably most adolescents considered themselves shy. So uh, at Grant, I had to decide at some point where I was going to college. And um, I didn't actually apply to that many schools. I applied to some of the UCs. Particularly, I was interested in UCLA, and uh, I applied to Stanford. I did get into Stanford. I got a, I think, a pretty much a, a significant scholarship to go there, and I was actually uh, registered to go there. I had my dorm room, and at the time, I actually was involved in kind of two singing groups. So one was called uh, the Peace of Mind, although we signed a recording contract and made an album called. Uh, under the name Bittersweet was our name uh, uh, on that album. And uh, we also put out a 45 that I understood did pretty well in Hawaii. <laughs> there was an anti-war song that we, that we sang in it. It was, it was actually a beautiful song. And then the other group was called the Hamsin, which means hot desert wind in Hebrew. And we actually did better in terms of actually earning any money because we did bar mitzvahs and weddings and other things like that where we could actually earn money. Um, 
so I had to decide uh, between moving off to Stanford or we were just involved in this recording contract and seeing stars and stuff in Hollywood. And also, uh, one of my mentors uh, kind of, I'm still angry at this, he put me down for choosing Stanford uh, over UCLA because I could continue Jewish education at UCLA where I would have a tough time at Stanford. So between those two issues, I actually gave up on the Stanford thing and pulled out at the last moment, although I'm not even sure they knew I pulled out because for about 10 years I got alumni mail um, and, and went to UCLA. And I, overall, that was probably a, a, a good decision, certainly because I met my wife there. <laughs> And all our kids are here because uh, I, I went to UCLA. Um, I had to decide at UCLA uh, what I was going to do. So I was pre-med, but I was completely torn between medicine and sort of education and music. And uh, I then decided... Um, I'll go down the medicine route because it's kind of hard to go down the music route and then do, then do medicine. That's a little harder. And then I also decided I would not have a major and I would try to get into UCLA or UCSF uh, for med school after three years. It was a gamble, but I, I wasn't that interested in 12 psychology courses or 12 calculus courses. So I didn't do that. And I just took my pre-med classes and whatever else I wanted to take at UCLA. So I took uh, two semesters, uh, two quarters of jazz. I took Shakespeare, uh, the Thanso, which is Korean flute. Uh, I took uh, Debbie when we were going together. I took music and dance at Greece with her. And a few other classes were integrated arts. It was just a lot of fun. And I could watch all my other pre-med uh, friends kicking themselves all over the place because they had to not only take pre-med, but 12 calculus courses. So uh, it, it was kind of nice, but it was a gamble. So I did decide to try the medicine thing, and I did apply earlier. But before that happened, when I was a junior, um, my high school government teacher, uh, Lou Barrick, who I actually remember sitting over here with my father-in-law uh, talking about their lives. They did a, a taping session. And, um, and uh, so he was my international and government teacher. And so when his niece graduated high school, he figured he at that time could fix her up with somebody. So uh, he uh, called up and uh, to a couple of people, one, me and uh, my friend who he also knew, uh, and I accepted the blind date, and uh, we went out to, oh, Joni Mitchell uh, concert at UCLA. And that was October 19th, 1969. And we never stopped seeing each other since then. We were three and a half years together before we got married, and then in 72 we got married, and now we're married about 42 years. So that worked very well. So that did happen uh, when we started dating. Uh, she was 17 and almost 18. It was just before her first week in, at UCLA, and I was two years older and uh, a couple years ahead. So that, that was nice ha uh, being uh, together, and, uh, and it made a recovery easier because I was uh, going out with somebody from camp and got dumped uh, by, uh, she, she dumped me for the quarterback at Montebello High School. So I didn't kind of match up to the quarterback. <laughs> but uh, I got the better woman. <laughs> Uh, it was an interesting relationship, my wife and I, because uh, we were a little bit yin and yang. I was a little bit concrete and not as abstract as my wife. I was very uh, 
mathematically oriented, although liked to do lots of traveling and other things, she was a dance major and very abstract. So I think that actually drew us together. And I think the quietness uh, that I had as an adolescent and in college, she actually brought, helped me come out of that and uh, make me more talkative. <laughs> Which is clear, I think. Sometimes you may regret that. <laughs> We were married in 1972. I was in medical school at that time, and in fact, didn't I, I hated my first year. Uh, we didn't do anything with patients. We had the most hours of gross anatomy than any uh, med school in the country at UCLA. I, I, I did choose UCLA over UC San Francisco because UCLA had pass-fail and I had no interest in grades. I just had interest in learning what seemed relevant and not whether it was an A or a B. So uh, I, I felt done with grades and I decided to do the pass-fail. Besides, at that time, Debbie's parents, before we were married, wouldn't let her go up to Berkeley. So I uh, stayed at UCLA. I talked to my dean and I was going to take a leave of absence after the first year. And what happened was they had these public health fellowships where they paid you like a thousand or two thousand dollars for the summer and you could take one of a few things and I had three choices. I had working in uh, Westchester or somewhere with a primary care doctor. That was number three on the list of what I wanted to do. The top two were um, at the time Yugoslavia was still there and that was doing public health in Yugoslavia. Uh, and that was sounded really interesting, but um, Debbie's parents wouldn't let her go with me to Yugoslavia. So, uh, again, until we were married and we were not. Um, and uh, then there was something called adolescent medicine that I actually didn't know much about, but it sounded like fun. So uh, I did that for the summer. I rotated through uh, the original free clinic on Fairfax and through Planned Parenthood and through the Job Corps and through Children's Hospital and the Teen Clinic and um, through Student Health actually at Northridge with Addie Klotz who was sort of the grandmother of College Health. And I loved every moment. I loved working with the teens. I loved the diversity of problems from reproductive health to mental health to dermatology to infections. And I decided, hey, I could go back to medical school and do this. Uh, and so I decided to go back and keep an interest in uh, adolescent health. So as I was approaching the fourth year and graduation, uh, Debbie and I, and, and I was graduating early because I had taken classes in the summer, um, we were finishing, I think, in March and uh, an old roommate of mine who did the Peace Corps in Thailand, he uh, had invited us because he went back to Thailand to live and do an English radio station and teach English in Thailand. So we started getting all the vaccines and everything. As I was showering one night, I found um, this big golf ball size object under my arm, which I knew was a lymph node, the hypochondriac medical student, figured I had Hodgkin's disease. So I went to Student Health. They did um, take out that lymph node. And as I was there in the room, and my parents were there, uh, my uh, uh, Debbie was obviously there, and everybody um, didn't look like it was Hodgkin's disease. I mean, Hodgkin's wasn't good. But at that time, even then, it had a high cure rate. And I was right. It wasn't Hodgkin's disease. It was metastatic melanoma. And um, the surgeon um, that they connected me with, who was one of the big myeloma specialists in the country and surgeons, a melanoma, excuse me, 
he, as he was going through this with me, he mentioned, well, there isn't a lot of things to treat this with uh, at that time, and uh, you have about a 2% several-year survival rate. So that, that didn't sound too promising. And uh, I had to think about this like, okay, I'm graduating medical school, 2 or 3% chance of living, do I go to Tahiti and drink Mai Tais, or do I go and take an internship and work 100 hours a week and be up all night for every third or fourth night? And it didn't actually take me long to come to a decision on that. And uh, that is, my way of living would have <laughs> never been to go to Tahiti and drink Mai Tais. It, it would have been <laughs> to choose the, the path of life and uh, know that I would do my best to be a survivor. Um, they did do a radical node dissection uh, at that time. They took out the rest of the lymph nodes here. And interestingly, they didn't find any that had cancer in them. They did find some that had actually macrophages, which is a type of white cell, eating up pigment, but no cancer. And they actually never found a primary, and there has to be a primary, which meant that my body uh, spontaneously killed it, which is really not that common. It's, it's a rarity, and even more rare probably in somebody 24. So this was tough on me, but it was very tough on Debbie to be married a year and have her dreams and, and thoughts of marriage and years and kids kind of smashed. And uh, But through our friends and family, we worked together, and I'm still here. Uh, that one actually never came back, although I did take five years of an experimental, one of the original early immunotherapies. What they did is they took cow tuberculosis, which they use nowadays and have used for years, in Russia, India, to try to prevent tuberculosis from going elsewhere in the body, to the brain and elsewhere. It does work for that. We don't use it in the United States that way. But Dr. Morton, who was my oncology surgeon, uh, thought that that might boost your immune system and fight off uh, the melanoma. So what that involved was taking a cell phone size object that has 120 uh, pins on it, needles on it, and you smear like a, a glumpy kind of stuff uh, that looks like gluey, and you spread it in four quadrants where lymph nodes exist, and then it's plunged in twice in each of those four, uh, every week for two years, and then every other week for two years, and then every month for a year. So it, it did mean a little more difficult internship because I had to plan my nights on call because you get like fevers with this. So you kind of have to, and fatigue, so you had to plan what was happening and nights on call because you didn't want to be on call with fevers. Uh, so it, it made a more difficult, interesting internship, but uh, I have learned one thing about me and that is I, I am uh, a resilient, kind of positive person. I don't, um, I don't think I've ever been in that set where it's like, well, why me? Why do I have cancer at 24? I'm not angry at the cancer. Uh, it's just one of those things, and I have to move on. And so I think that positivity and optimism has been very helpful. Uh, my parents um, were very supportive through all this. They were supportive through my whole life. In fact, sometimes they were too supportive. Um, they were like, uh, if their friends were over, they'd want me to get up and sing. Uh, so if I had a pet peeve, that was the pet peeve, because then I refused all singing because I was like pushed my buttons but uh, they were proud of me and uh, 
I gave him a rough time in that respect. But I, I never realized how much the cancer affected him until my mother, it was actually when she died, and I found my father and mother had gone on a marriage enrichment weekend. So their two notebooks were in the closet. So I read the two notebooks, and it was difficult reading because my mother in particular was talking about how difficult of a time she had with me being sick. It was actually a remarkable two volumes to read, to hear my father's perspective on life and marriage and my mother's perspective on life and marriage. Um, in uh, some degree, there's a little repetition here in that my father was sick his whole married life. And uh, to some degree, I, I had cancer, but after that, we it never came back. And so I was able to think until 10 years ago that everything was fine and we'd uh, go down that sunset pathway and travel after I retired. I was in my, going back to my residency, I did internal medicine with my mind being on teenagers and young adults and college students. Uh, that was my interest. So it was near the end of my residency that I had to choose what I was going to do a fellowship in. So there were three choices that I was interested in. Rheumatology, number three. Uh, endocrine, number two, which was quite interesting because I didn't choose it, but my middle son, who uh, went into medicine, did go into endocrine. So uh, that's been kind of fun. Um, the first choice, and the one that I actually did do, was uh, adolescent medicine, which uh, my chair of internal medicine, or the head of internal medicine at Cedars, had a rough time with. First, he wanted me to go to rheumatology because he was a rheumatologist. He would have accepted endocrine, but he had a tough time accepting adolescent medicine. It was like, so you just want to take care of zits all the time? Uh, he, he didn't really understand the breadth and depth of uh, adolescent health care and the importance, but uh, that was okay. I, I had enough of an ego that it didn't matter that he, <laughs> he wasn't accepting that. So I took uh, the fellowship at uh, Children's Hospital. Um, at that time, it wasn't yet uh, a board-certifiable um, field. It was as of 1994, but it wasn't when I went into it uh, initially. Uh, so I was scheduled for a two-year fellowship, and I finished my first year, and... Um, Actually, at that point in time, just before that, I can't, I can't forget it, 1978, just about the time, I guess that was when I was doing my fellowship or started. Actually, it was the last three months. It was April, during Passover. So it was just before I started my fellowship in July. Uh, Yael, our first of three, was born. And uh, that was uh, a great time. Uh, actually, our three kids were, one was born during Sukkot. Passover, one was born during Sukkot, and one was born during Shavuot. So we have Shalosh Regalim and our three kids. Um, so Yael uh, was born, and that, that was wonderful. And I did the fellowship, but was only going to do, uh, I was going to do the two years, but at the end of the first year, um, one of the attendings left, so they offered me a faculty position at the end of the first year. And I figured that would be great. Uh, at least it pays a little more, and we might be able to buy a house. Uh, and uh, actually, by then, we had already bought a house. But that, that made it a little bit easier. Um, uh, I was able to actually take some classes that I would have done as a fellow, because I was a little behind on statistics. And so I took some of those, uh, and uh, it... it 
I was having a grand time because my time was split between seeing patients, teaching in the teen clinic, uh, rotating through some of the other clinics, the free clinic, the job corps, and I did a lot of the contracts to establish new clinics and actually to establish that all children's hospital residents have to take adolescent health care. Uh, so instead of three people coming through a year, we had all, whatever it was, 25 residents coming through. So that turned into a, a lot of fun. So um, I became very active in adolescent health care and started to build uh, a portfolio of lectures and publications. I liked academics. Uh, I did quite a lot of research and in education, in reproductive health. My special interests were sexually transmitted diseases, reproductive health, education, uh, but just about anything that came of interest I uh, found interesting and would, would do. Uh, we rapidly had, well, fairly rapidly, three years later, uh, we had a, another child that was uh, uh, Aaron, and uh, then um, about a year and a half later or so, uh, a year and a half to two years later, we had David, and those were our, our three kids. Um, I was very happy at uh, Children's. Debbie was very happy teaching at three schools at the time, and our kids were all wonderful. They, uh, they got, well, David and Aaron actually got along wonderfully well. They never had a fight in their entire life. I think. To this day, I can't remember them ever fighting. But, but it's been said in our family that's because they had a common enemy, which was our daughter. Uh, she's wonderful, but she, she did treat them a little bit like she was a Lucy in the comics. Uh, and so she gave them a little bit of a rough time. And so I, I think, uh, but, but they all get along uh, together great. Um, uh, moving along, I think I developed academically, and, and I very early on, I decided I was writing these chapters for the fellows to learn, and I felt, you know, this looks like and sounds like a book. So I turned it into a book called Adolescent Health, and uh, it got published, and it became actually the New England Journal at that time called it the Bible of Adolescent Health. So it's done well and I'm working right now on the sixth edition. Um, so it's continued uh, over the years and has led to some wonderful relationships around the world and invitations to wherever uh, Spain and Portugal and a bunch of other Israel and a bunch of other places. So. It, 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 that that was. It's been some of the stuff for me. Um, I don't know. It said you can do stuff for yourself or do stuff to make a name for yourself. For me, it's always been about can I do something that makes a difference, whether it be at children's hospital or whether it be at the job corps or whether it be a book that gets disseminated and used so it, it reaches lots of people that I could never actually teach. And so I have been fortunate to have three sabbaticals and on my first sabbatical in 1991, uh, all of us, our three kids and Debbie, we lived in Cambridge University in England and it wasn't on that one, but it was on one of the, it was on the second sabbatical then, then we were in Lausanne, Switzerland, and so we've been very fortunate to, to spend seven months in foreign countries. I wrote a curriculum, teaching curriculum, for online. And so that went out and, and gets about 250,000 hits a year, a third of which are from like developing countries, Africa, Eastern Europe. And so I can hit and reach people to learn about adolescent health where there are no teachers and it's all free because as my kids always say, Dad, what are you going to do something that actually earns money? And so, 
I've never regretted any of that, actually. It earns a little money, but uh, it, it, it's been uh, fun. So uh, they all uh, grew up. We had a wonderful time. I tried to do the best balance I could at Children's between a uh, common theme today, which is work and family life. So although I worked far more than 40, 50, 60 hours a week, I did those hours at times that wouldn't necessarily interrupt me being a baseball coach or uh, building the cars that you race down the tracks with the kids. So I would try to spend as much time as I could with them, but worked really hard on the academic side to do uh, whether it was writing or, or research articles. And so life moved very fast through those years of our uh, three kids and seeing them move on. And they all three, uh, it's very fortunate, have three kids that are all just incredible. And they all went their kind of different ways. And um, until uh, my daughter, who uh, met a wonderful man, uh, Israeli dancing. And uh, it was a little tough getting used to because he was 10 years older. He was divorced with two kids. But actually, they got married, and, and those two kids are wonderful. I, ha I consider them grandchildren. And uh, she's been taking care of them uh, a lot since uh, they were about four or five, and now they're in college. We traveled a lot, and I was a heavy bicycle rider, and so when we were in L.A., I would bike ride once or twice every weekend for 25 or 30 miles, kind of up, up, up in the hills, or I would hike. And in January of 2005, I felt something when I jumped off my bike, and I was bedridden for about a week. Uh, and they took an MRI, and they didn't really see anything, and it went away. And then it, it sort of came back, they did a scan, and then they said, oh, we think there's a spot there, and we think it's a compression fracture and that you have cancer. Um, and so we were very drawn together, the family, uh, and then they decided, the neuroradiologists and everybody, that it wasn't cancer, that it was osteoporosis, and that's why I had a compression fracture. My daughter was married in June of that year, and I had no pain. And so that was wonderful, because I was dancing, and, and, and it was just a wonderful wedding. However, in October of that year, the pain got worse, and uh, I'll never forget that evening. I went for a PET CT scan at um, SC, and the neuroradiologist asked me, do I want to see my scan? And it was like, he should have never showed me my scan. He could have just told me, you have a bad looking scan, you've got to get over to your doctor. So my scan looked like a Christmas tree. I, I, was, I lit up throughout my entire bone frame. I had one large lesion on my back, which they biopsied, and it was multiple myeloma. I guess I like MMs, metastatic melanoma, and my... Uh, multiple myeloma, uh, two incurable diseases. <laughs> now I have two incurable cancers. Um, the good thing about multiple myeloma is that it was better than having a reoccurrence at that time of melanoma all over my entire body. Uh, and there was some treatment. And in fact, treatment was starting to get better for multiple myeloma right at that point in time. Uh, I had to make a choice. Um, I could get my treatment in L.A., or I could go to where some people said, go to University of Arkansas. It's the premier place, and uh, they do this double transplant. And uh, I did a lot of research, talking to other doctors. And uh, for me, I couldn't do it. I couldn't live in Arkansas, in Little Rock, I needed to be amongst my family, working here, and uh, I needed that support, and it was worth more than 
if there was a couple of percent higher rate, but there was no evidence that their treatment was really better. So I got treated here and got sort of a team of doctors, a local oncologist, my internist, uh, City of Hope, uh, another myeloma specialist at Cedars who was also well-known. And uh, I got induction therapy with uh, three drugs. Uh, at the time, they don't use this regimen anymore. They gave the equivalent of 1,000 milligrams of prednisone. Uh, I had never given more than, I don't know, 100 milligrams of prednisone. I had never given 1,000. Uh, but you got 1,000 milligrams of prednisone every four days. Four days on, four days off, four days on, four days off. And the four days on, uh, probably some people would have had to be tied up in a straitjacket. But I went to work. I worked kind of full-time during the induction. And it uh, was an interesting time. I was on two other uh, heavy drugs. And uh, with those three drugs, I did go into remission. But with myeloma, it's very common to go into remission and then just bounce out. I, I have learned to be very vigilant of my disease and watch carefully and, and question things. Uh, one of the first drugs I was on was thalidomide, which was the drug that caused all those weird defects, and then they discovered it works for myeloma. But at one point I became very short of breath. I couldn't walk 20 yards, 10 yards. So they did a, a treadmill and they looked like it was positive, they sent me to cardiologist, and they were ready to take me in and do a catheterization and a stent. And I said, whoa, hold on. I, 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 this, there's not something right here. I was recently doing biking into the hills. I've never had anything to suggest heart disease. Can we do a different test first? So they did one of the uh, dye studies, uh, uh, and it uh, turned out, everything, my arteries were completely normal. So we stopped the thalidomide and within two weeks I was bike riding 30 miles again. So uh, clearly I didn't have a heart problem. There are some articles that show that this drug can cause shortness of breath. Uh, that is not from a heart problem. So um, I saved myself a stent at that time and uh, uh, a procedure. So that, that, that has been a common theme over the years. I then had a stem cell transplant using my own stem cells. Uh, that went very well. I didn't need any transfusions and I was out quickly. I, I used through my first cancer and this cancer a lot of guided imagery. So I would image like um, good cells, kind of eating up cancer cells, and in the myeloma, I would do it to some songs. I had three key songs. I had a, a Witchy Woman by the Eagles, because uh, that just was like a fighting song. I had uh, Neil Diamond's um, America, because it talks about immigrants coming home, and I had to image my stem cells that they were injecting in me uh, coming back to the bone marrow and, and establishing a home there. And then there was a Hebrew song, Shayyubana Veda Migdash, which is rebuilding the temple. So I was seeing that as rebuilding my bone marrow. Um, so uh, I was in complete remission after my transplant. I went back to work. Uh, those six weeks, uh, I think, were the only times during the 10 years I've had myeloma except until a year ago that I wasn't working full-time, which for me is about 150 to 200 percent. Um, because at, by that time, in 1995, I moved from Children's Hospital to the main campus and took over the health uh, entity for the students. And so I think when I started, I had 85 staff, but when I left recently uh, for medical leave, uh, the staff was 300. So it built up and we did build probably the, the best state-of-the-art 
health center. It's six stories and 105,000 square feet. It did take me 19 years of lobbying, but it, it did get built. So it was nice to see it, <laughs> it, it, it be there. Um, so I went from one regiment to another. After the transplant, my light chains, which is the tumor marker, after six months started to go up a little bit. So I went on one drug that worked for three years, and then I went in 2010 to a mega a relapse, and I went to the Mayo Clinic in, um, in Scottsdale, Arizona, and tried another new drug that failed. But the doctor there said, try this other regimen called Cybor-D. Sounded like something from the Terminator, but um, stands for Cytoxin Cybor. The Bor is a Velcade. It's the technical term for Velcade, and the D is Decadron, high-dose steroids. And within, um, my levels had gone up to 11,500 from 50, and um, I was having 15 out of 10 bone pain, and uh, it went in one and a half weeks from that 11,500 down to 900, and eventually back down to 50. So it, it was an incredible run of another three years with that drug, but quickly I went through there are five novel agents, and cytoxin, which is an older agent, and uh, I went through them all and became resistant to them all. Um, at that point in time, I tried a last regiment using two drugs I was resistant to, hoping that this new great drug that was coming out called DARA, which is a monoclonal antibody to uh, the myeloma cell, it clumps on and kills the cell, your lymphocytes kill that, that, that combo, um, but it didn't, the two drugs didn't hold me in time to wait for DARA to come out, but they had a trial at UCSF of SAR, which is the same drug by a different company. So that gets us into really not that long ago, because I started on SAR in um, April 13th. Um, and I got to dose three, three weeks. And every week I had higher and higher fevers until when I came home after the third dose, I was having close to 104 shaking chills, and uh, they admitted me, and uh, they couldn't stop the fevers, and I developed a whiteout of my lung, which looked like a hypersensitivity interstitial, which is a type of pneumonia. Everybody thought that I was <coughs> having a reaction to the monoclonal antibody, which does happen, although those never happened in any of the trials. Uh, they've had 300 or so patients on SAR. Uh, I was the first to have anything like this. But, you know, someone has to be the first when you're doing an experimental trial. And so I was thrown off the study, and if I was on the committee, I would have thrown myself off also. And so I ended up in the hospital for a week, and steroids did help, and my lungs cleared up, and I went home. And during that time, and a few weeks later, uh, I was doing um, much, much worse. I had, uh, and now, as I am now, I, I lost uh, 24 pounds. I went from about 165, 166. Debbie always felt I should stay that way, so I'd have an extra 10 pounds if I got sick to lose, which is not bad advice. Um, but I lost 25 to 26 pounds, so I'm at 140. Um, and uh, it has made me much, much uh, weaker. Um, everybody, uh, we have an enormous amount of friends. Uh, I have uh, a few childhood friends that, that were in my singing group that I've been friends with, close friends since. Uh, we have had a Havara that's been together for about 30 years, um, and, and many other friends that have just been incredibly supportive. My kids have been supportive. Debbie has been an incredible support. So it's, it's been wonderful, although during this time, uh, and I skipped over that, my father died 10, 12 years ago. My mother died 
Uh, actually, my mother was remarkable. I can't miss that. In, in that last week, her last year, she had five great years at the village with a hip fracture and worsening dementia her last year at the Jewish home. And she, she was in the greatest room there. And we had, um, uh, with aside from all their great staff, we had somebody that was uh, we hired for her also. Um, it was a horrible year. But she had a green dress. And that was for <laughs> my middle son's wedding, which was right around the high holidays. She was going downhill. And it got to the point where it, it, I wasn't sure she was going to make it be alive for the wedding. We might have a death the day before the wedding. And I actually talked to um, one of my rabbis about what we do, but weddings have to go on. So she was having uh, hospice care also, and I, and I didn't want her going into a hospital um, because that is something she didn't want to, want to do, and there wasn't much that we could do for her. So I decided what I would do is put her on some IV fluid, put her on some oxygen, and see what happens. And she totally perked up. So I asked um, Aaron and Karen, do they want my mother at the wedding? Because she could be there and have a paramedic run. Um, but they absolutely wanted her. So she did come down with her caregiver. She was there at the wedding in a green dress. She made it. And I think she was there mentally. Um, and then in fact, a week later, or a few days later, she was having a birthday. So we had all of the, her kids, grandkids, um, there at the Jewish home and had a birthday party for her. And then I think she died the next night. Debbie's parents, uh, and, and I haven't spoken enough about them because they were, they were hot, remarkable. Her father was in a, a little biking group that biked every weekend, and he's a much better biker than me. He, he actually has biked across the country uh, in three legs, a thousand miles each, and he also biked from um, Louisiana to Canada. Uh, up the Mississippi, um, and uh, he's a remarkable hiker and just a remarkable knowledge uh, person. And he's done many hikes with me, and we've traveled with them to many parts of the world. Um, they're just two wonderful, remarkable people. Uh, ben is uh, definitely a Marine. He was uh, both in World War II and in the Korean War. He was uh, one of the first Americans in um, Nagasaki after the atomic bomb. Fortunately for him, there were two groups that got to Nagasaki. One did sort of administration of the town, and the other were in tractors cleaning up the atomic debris. Uh, of the ones that cleaned up the atomic debris, there was quite a high prevalence of cancer, uh, but not in those that were doing sort of the administrative work. Um, so he was pretty active in, in World War II, as was his brother, who hit Normandy, I think, in D-Day plus five, uh, but did survive. Um, the... Um, my mother-in-law is remarkable in that she was in the Orthodox community, but she was <laughs> she was <laughs> quite the maverick. Uh, she was into yoga, you know, in the fifties, and she was into she went to Esalon and the hot tubs before they were popular in the sixties and seventies. 
So, and she was quite the world traveler. So she, uh, and she really knew how to gather a group of people and, and get them together and talk and a skill that I did not have. It took us maybe a year or two to, to really hit it off because I think in the first year I was an intern and she had lots of parties and I missed a lot because I was either on call or post call and she didn't quite understand that, why I couldn't make the parties. But we got over that after the first year. Anyway, getting back to where I was, which was uh, my chemotherapy, and after I became resistant, and then I broke down with this new experimental drug. So I had nothing uh, to take. <clears throat> but there is an old-time drug that actually comes from a World War II uh, horrible thing, uh, nitrogen mustard, and they developed one of the first alkylating agents called bendamustine, uh, which was one of the first chemotherapies used in the 60s, and it's come back because it still has action, and so if you're resistant to all this stuff, you might respond to bendamustine. So May 27th, I took the first dose, and uh, that night, Debbie found me standing up uh, in the bedroom, totally confused. I, I didn't know who I I knew, I guess I knew my name. Didn't know anything else. So the paramedics took me to uh, St. Joseph's Hospital, and uh, they did a brain CT and a CT scan, and it, it looked horrible, like some type of encephalopathy, and just everything was white. But it wasn't a stroke, but it didn't look right. And then when I woke up six hours later, I didn't know any objects, like if you showed me that camera, I would have no idea what it was. You showed me the glass, I would look at it and have no idea what it was. And But by the next day, I knew all the objects and I had a little visual problem, but by 48 hours I was neurologically back, although it was a, great, a bit, very big hit to me. Um, the neurologist, uh, thought it was a syndrome called PRES, posterior, reversible, which is a good word, uh, encephalopathy, inflammation of the brain, uh, syndrome. And it actually does occur in some monoclonal antibodies, which is what that experimental drug was. And in fact, he, he saw me a week later and said, we're going to repeat the scan, uh, the CT, uh, and it's going to be normal. And, uh, in fact, uh, he did repeat it. And, in fact, it was completely normal, which kind of blew me away, because one looked like horrific and the other looked great, and it was only about 10 days difference. Um, and then I, I, he said, I am sure glad that it's normal, because i got to tell you, if it wasn't normal, I am not sure what I would be able to tell you and do. But, but that was good that it was normal. I also developed another problem, which was I was total tachycardia, a high heart rate whenever I stood up. So my heart rates were running 125, 130 when I would stand, which meant it felt like I had just climbed a mountain and all I did was stand. So uh, that hasn't totally gone away. We controlled it a little bit. But uh, I have to say, after all of these hits, and three hospitalizations, and losing um, 25 pounds, and having totally out of control myeloma. Um, uh, I'm not feeling very well. <laughs> it's been hard. It actually wasn't that long ago. It was after I recovered from the first time, the first thing, in the lungs, I was able to start walking again, and I was walking three miles around the neighborhood. But now I have trouble walking down to the end of the street. Um, it's just taken a lot out of me. So it certainly is what I call um, a tipping point. I've had many tipping points. This one's probably the worst. You know, I have uncontrollable myeloma with not many drugs that are obtainable now. Um, the future looks very bright. Um, and in fact, 
years ago, somebody with myeloma never would have lived 10 years. And in fact, I talked to Dana Farber. Ken Anderson is the myeloma head, one of the experts, and was asking, I quickly told him in three or four minutes my history and from the two cancers and what I've been on, and then I got from him the things he would take. The first thing he said was, I have to tell you, Larry, if there were a hundred people with that history, probably only be one alive right now. So do have something working for you. Doesn't feel like it today or right now, but that's what it does. So I am facing with a lot of support. Uh, my kids and grandkids are have five grandkids. Uh, my son, who's the doctor, has a daughter. Charlotte, who's wonderful. Uh, the two step grandkids are wonderful in college, and one's uh, going to be a senior at Berkeley this year, actually teaching a course. So, Tom Brockwell recently was diagnosed with myeloma two years ago, and he wrote a book called My Lucky Life Interrupted. And I really attuned to that. I've had a Shred up. Lucky love. Interrupted with some shit, but whatever happens won't stop those 65 years. And in, in values. Um, my values, I think Debbie's values, um, I have always focused on transparency honesty, tikkun olam making the world a better place. Um, but what our, Debbie and I have always put our focus on has been our kids' education. There was one time we, we had a torn couch for many years, and one of our kids wanted to know why we didn't get a new couch. And I was ready to strangle him since... We paid for about 68 years with uh, some help from Debbie's father um, for uh, private schools. 68 years of private schools is a lot of money. But we also focused on travel. And so living in Cambridge for us and our kids was, was wonderful. Living in uh, Lausanne in Switzerland and being able to travel uh, quite a bit, and working with uh, an international group there in adolescent medicine was wonderful. We've had many, many trips within the United States. I've had many trips uh, because of lecturing, to uh, whether it's been to Hawaii or Montana, uh, or being invited, as I mentioned, I think, to Spain or Portugal or Israel. Uh, it, it's been great. I uh, Debbie and I and our middle son did a medical mission in North Vietnam um, and we were up in the far north in some small communes but it was uh, a phenomenal uh, experience and about half of us were non-Vietnamese uh, Americans and the other half of the group were, uh, were American Vietnamese who had were like fled Vietnam at the end of the war, and this was their first time back, so working there medically was uh, phenomenal. Uh, we traveled to China with the USC marching band, and every city we went to where they, we played at, and, and including the Great Wall of China, they, they just tra treated us incredible, although the Chinese had a really tough time with those uh, Roman outfits. It was you know, really hot, and they couldn't figure out those outfits that the band had. But uh, we've um, had, we went to New Zealand and Australia. Australia was a medical thing for a few days, but we spent quite a bit of time traveling throughout New Zealand, uh, the uninhabited half, um, and lots of trips to Israel, lots of trips to um, Europe. <clears throat> In fact, when I was on the BCG for the treatment for melanoma, uh, for close to two months, we 
took it and put it in a refrigerator box, and we traveled around uh, Europe and Israel, uh, and I would just inject myself every week um, and uh, continue to, to, to travel at that point. And, and, and in adolescent medicine, um, the colleagues that I been able to have um, internationally and nationally have just been uh, amazing, amazing people. Um, and so it's uh, it's been it's it's just been uh, wonderful. I, I I am trying to stay well enough to actually, and I've started the book. It's it's surviving the big C. And it's about this journey and things that you can do as a person, whether it has to do from guided imagery uh, or just having an advocate for you that's watching what's going on. Uh, there are many things. Um, and uh, trying to put that down to paper. And, and so uh, I have like, you know, lots of pages of notes from things, because I write a lot about this. Uh, to friends, and they write me back wonderful things. So, trying to encapsulate some of that and some of the lessons I've learned is something I'm. I'd love to finish. Um, so, yeah, I do want to end. I, I can't not say how much my five grandchildren and my five children uh, have been a, a support to me and, and it's, they've just been wonderful but the person that's meant <laughs> the most is uh, my wife who has had to live through my illnesses for 42 years and now been sort of a caregiver through this hard time. So, I love her very much. It's a careless thing to talk. Didn't know you were here. <laughs> you didn't hear me talk. She's the one that was born in Paso. <laughs> I've just been lucky to pretty much the best parents there is around and I think it's always made it both a blessing and almost a curse because it's always been a challenge to live up to them and do them proud and be the type of parents that they are and I think my husband also has really big shoes to fill and I think that can be hard on him too because he knows that he's always getting compared to my dad and a big part of why I married my husband is because I saw a lot of the qualities of my my dad and my husband it, the type of father how family came first friendship came first experiences caring for other people and I know we talked we not talked about tikkun olam and doing mitzvot and caring for other people and those are all the same things that are important too to my husband <laughs> and I've just been so fortunate to I don't know my dad mentioned but we moved into my grandmother's house so we're lucky that we live well there was a point where we weren't looking into houses in this neighborhood even I think one right behind here mm. which might have been a little bit too close for comfort mm. but we're lucky that we live about a mile away and my kids have gotten to be over here all the time my dad can could make him I'll come this week play guitar to my kids sing them to bed come read books and that my kids have gotten the opportunity to have that tight relationship with my parents And he put up with me. I wasn't an easy teenager. <laughs> I was not. 
have always supported me probably too much to the detriment of my mom because there's nothing that my dad would stand up for me a lot or I knew how to kind of manipulate them one against another very well then you know would be payback time yeah, that, for that my daughter a good job. <laughs> but he always had a lot of patience to help me with homework he'd get very frustrated and um, but I was not an easy kid. <laughs> so I'm sorry for those many years of putting through a lot of turmoil. <laughs> but I have to say, the 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 <clears throat> I did with my friend who's adolescent medicine in, in Denver, and we did two workshops at the national meeting, and they are they were on what is it like to raise your adolescence as an adolescent medicine expert. And it was an amazingly fun hour and a half. It was like a group therapy session for like, you know, 75 or 100 people. Because many of them, you know, you could learn X. It doesn't mean X happens. And it's hard to then necessarily change it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I, I had a tough time trying to get feedback from my kids. I wanted to, I wanted to hear from them what it was like to have me as their dad doing adolescent medicine. <clears throat> and when I'd ask them, they wouldn't tell me a thing. So I emailed them, and emailing them, they actually returned a response. And <laughs> but I didn't get it. I don't think I predicted it quite right, Aaron who I thought um, wouldn't mind it, but did mind it. I think you were the opposite, but I, I can't quite remember. I just remember getting lots of puberty books as bought bits of a present <laughs> instead of checks or other things. Well, we had a... <laughs> Which was interesting <clears throat> material when I would have friends sleep over we could read about circle jerking and yeah. <laughs> I was learning about a lot of interesting things I was kind of teaching a lot of my friends about sex <laughs> via all these books yeah we did we did have some interesting and dinner drugs. dinner conversations since I had so much interest in sexually transmitted diseases that would not be an uncommon dinner conversation so it, I, I looked at it as a teachable moment <laughs> and, and so they did pick up a lot about reproductive health care I think leading services on Yom Kippur and asked me why I was wearing white tennis shoes. I thought it was a great question and would make a great children's book. So we turned it into a children's book and <clears throat> my Debbie's friend is a wonderful illustrator. So she uh, did the illustrations and I did the text. school graduation.
for bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, for weddings of my children, and uh, actually for funerals also. May God bless and keep you always. May your wishes all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every rung and may you stay forever young, forever young. To be righteous, may you grow up to be true. May your hands always be busy, may your feet always be swift, may you have a strong foundation when the winds are changing shifts. May your heart always be joyful. May your song always be sung, and may you stay forever young, forever young, forever young.